Hello and welcome back to the Bookshelf Odyssey podcast. My name is Art and I'm the host of the show today. And uh, we're going to continue our mini series of a deep dive into Dickens. Uh, and again, we are exploring Great Expectations and we'll, we're looking at chapters 18 and 19 today. And that will bring us to the conclusion of part one of the book. A lot of exciting things are happening in this chapter today. We get a bombshell dropped on the plot that is going to send it off into completely new directions. Uh, before we do get to that, I did want to make a quick announcement to say that I will be posting th these videos on Saturdays rather than Fridays from now on. It just works better in my schedule that way. Anyway, nothing too major. I'm looking forward to getting back into this book with you all. Uh, I really appreciate your thoughts and comments and insights into the book. And even if you're behind, you know, that's okay. Just uh, uh, as always, just keep keep posting on the videos that you are watching. And I'm more than happy to go back and uh, interact with you on some previous videos. So uh, with that out of the way, uh, let's go ahead and dive into Dickens. So we begin chapter 18. It is part 11 of Great Expectations. We find out in the very first sentence that some time has passed now. It's been four years of Pip's apprenticeship with Joe. It sounds like in those four years or the time that's passed, things are just going as they always have. Pip has been learning the trade of blacksmithing and, you know, we left him off from chapter 17. It looks like he's thinking, this is it. This is my life. I'm going to be a blacksmith. Although he's continued his desire to want to be a gentleman. So we find our plucky heroes enjoying a beverage at the Jolly uh, Three Jolly Bargemen as they are wont to do, being told, and, and they're being told a story by Mr. Wopsle, who's um, reciting to them this uh, murder case that's been in the newspaper. And I'm picturing him telling this story around the table as they're all drinking and enjoying each other's company. And I was kind of laughing as I was reading this because it seems to me that all they needed was a microphone and a recorder, and Mr. Wopsle could have had his own true crime podcast. <laughs> I was trying to think about what that would be like. And I don't know. Uh, but here he is. He's reciting this when or he, he's telling them about this uh, murder that he's been reading in the paper. And they all assume that the guy who's being suspected of it is the killer. Well, uh, a strange gentleman or a strange man be jumps in the conversation and begins to question Mr. Wopsle with kind of uh, almost lawyer like language. And for good reason. Turns out the man was a lawyer, but I, I always enjoy when Mr. Wopsle gets put in his place. So uh, he challenges him on their assuming the man is guilty before any evidence has been presented. The stranger is trying to tell is, you know, jumps into the conversation and is telling them that, um, you know, how, how can you do this when you might be called upon to be the juror and the jury is going to be expected to be uh, without prejudice without preconceived um, assumption. He even asks him these questions. Uh, how, the, how can he lay his head upon his pillow after having pronounced a fellow creature guilty unheard? He goes on to say that the same man might be summoned as a juryman upon this very trial, and having thus deeply committed himself, might return to the bosom of his family and lay his head upon his pillow, after deliberately swearing that he would well and truly try the issue joined between our sovereign lord the king and the prisoner at the bar, and would a true verdict give according to the evidence, so help him God. So, you know, he's, he's calling him out on that, that, hey, you, uh, you got to wait before the evidence to be given before you make a decision. I don't think that Dickens ever uses stories or lines as just filler. It may, it may seem like that, and maybe sometimes he does, but I think there's something in this opening chapter that we will want to keep in mind, especially the idea of not making assumptions and not making declarations until all the facts are in and have been presented. Uh, just something, something to keep in mind, I think. The strange gentleman asks for Joe Gargery, and so Joe introduces himself and says that he wants that he wants to talk to Pip and Joe privately about a matter that he's here to do business on. And Pip says this about the stranger. The stranger did not recognize me, but I recognized him as the gentleman I had met on the stairs. 
on the occasion of my second visit to Miss Havisham. I had known him the moment I saw him looking over the settle, and now that I stood confronting him with his hand upon my shoulder, I checked off again in detail his large head, his dark complexion, his deep-set eyes, his bushy black eyebrows, his large watch-chain, his strong black dots of beard and whisker, and even the smell of scented soap on his great hand. "'I wish to have a private conference with you two, said he, when he had surveyed me at his leisure. "'It will take a little time. Perhaps we had better go to your place of residence.' Uh, so if we go back to page 80, now you remember that Pip runs into a man on the stairs. I think it was his second visit to Miss Havisham's. Here's how he's described on the stairs. He was a burly man of exceedingly dark complexion with an exceedingly large head and a corresponding large hand. He took my chin in his large hand and turned up my face to have a look at me by the light of the candle. He was prematurely bald on the top of his head and had bushy black eyebrows that wouldn't lie down but stood up bristling. His eyes were set very deep in his head and were disagreeably sharp and suspicious. He had a large watch chain and strong black dots where his beard and whiskers would have been if he had let them. He was nothing to me, and I could have had no, no foresight then that he ever would be anything to me, but it happened that I had this opportunity of observing him well. "'Boy of the neighborhood, eh?' said he. "'Yes, sir,' said I. "'How, how do you come here?' "'Miss Havisham sent for me, sir,' I explained. "'Well, behave yourself. I have a pretty large experience of boys, and you're a bad set of fellows. Now mind,' said he, biting the side of his great forefinger as he frowned at me. "'You behave yourself.' And I had read that quote before. That was the point where I wondered, you know, does anybody like Pip? Here's a stranger who, you know, grabs a hold of Pip, is checking him over, telling him to behave himself, saying that boys are trouble. And now the stranger is back. And I love the similarities and discussions that Dickens was able to maintain that consistency in the weeks that have passed between these two, these two parts. We come to find that uh, this man's name is Jaggers, and he's a lawyer from London. And he's pretty well known. But he has uh, some business to transact with them. He begins by saying he's, he is wanting to relieve Joe of his apprentice, Pip. And I was wondering if Joe would be, will, would be wanting any money to compensate for losing his apprentice. We don't know why yet. Um, the, that bombshell has not dropped quite yet. Joe basically is like, I don't want to stand in the way of Pip. I don't need any money for him. And so he tells Mr. Jaggers, no, Mr. Jaggers says, you know, that you won't get a second chance. This is it. If you want something, speak now or forever, hold your peace kind of idea. And, and Joe says no. And he uses this kind of in, this interesting um, description. I think it has allusions to Shakespeare from what my uh, footnotes said. But it says, bear in mind then that brag is a good dog, but hold fast is a better. Bear that in mind, will you? Repeated Mr. Jaggers, shutting his eyes and nodding his head at Joe as if he were forgiving him something. And uh, basically what that means is that promises are good, but acts are better. So that's maybe another little plot thread I, I think we should hold on to. That idea that you can make promises and that's good, but your acts, what you do is going to be far better. Your actions will reveal more about you than your promises will. Okay, and so then we get the sentence that changes the entire direction of this book. It says, Now I return to this young fellow, and the communication I have got to make is that he has great expectations. Uh, in other words, he has an inheritance. He has a big, a large inheritance. Of course, Joe and Pip are both astonished. Mr. Jaggers continues to tell him that, that his benefactor, who is going to wish to rename, remain anonymous for now, wants Pip to always keep his name Pip. He wants him to go to London to be trained and educated as a gentleman. And Pip says this. He says, my dream was out. My wild fancy was surpassed by sober reality. Miss Havisham was going to make my fortune on a grand scale. Uh, you know, he's already thinking this is Miss Havisham's doing. Uh, I'm, I'm, my dream has come true. This is what he has longed for, uh, this whole novel, really. Well, not not the whole novel. I would say since the moment he was shown to the Havisham's house, through the discussing of the plans 
we find that he's going to be sent to a man whose name we've been introduced to before, Mr. Matthew Pocket, and will be educated by him on how to be a gentleman. And that is uh, a man that they heard speak of at Miss Havisham's house, the, the, the man who would be standing at the head of the table as Miss Havisham's body was laid out after she uh, passed. So they agree to this. And again, uh, Jaggers asks uh, Joe if he wants compensation for Pip. And, and Joe gets quite angry with this and, and, and very frustrated that he doesn't want money for Pip. You know, Joe continues to be a good man here. And I love these two paragraphs that describe Joe's response to, uh, to Pip and the loss of his services. You know, that's why he wants to compensate him. And, you know, I, I say that's fair that, you know, I'm counting on this young man. Uh, he's paid money for this. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm counting on him to bring in money. And now he's gone. Um, I, we should have some compensation for that. You know, I, I understand that. But Joe doesn't want to do that. I love this. Uh, for me, it's on page 136. It's after Jagger says that he might want compensation for loss of his services. Joe laid his hand upon my shoulder with the touch of a woman. I have often thought him since, like the steam hammer that can crush a man or pat an eggshell, in his combination of strength with gentleness. Pip is that hearty welcome, said Joe, to go free with his services, to honor and fortune, as no words can tell of. But if you think as money can make compensation to me for the loss of the little child, what come to the forge, and ever the best of friends? Oh, dear good Joe, whom I was so ready to leave and so unthankful to, I see you again with your muscular blacksmith's arm before your eyes and your broad chest heaving and your voice dying away. Oh, dear good faithful tender Joe, I feel the loving tremble of your hand upon my arm. As solemn this day as if it had been the rustle of an angel's wing. That is just beautifully described, I think, that Joe touches his shoulder with the touch of a woman. What Dickens is saying there is that Joe, and it contrasts this, that though he is he's strong, his hands are hard and calloused, and you know, he could beat up anyone in town, uh, he has all the strength, yet he responds with gentleness. His touch is soft and tender. Uh, And I think this is what makes Joe a good man, is that he's not toxic, okay? He's not, he's not brash. He's, he's not violent without cause, but though he has strength, his strength is under control and he can respond with tenderness and feeling and compassion. And those are the things that I think make a good man. Uh, a good person. Older Pip, as narrator, is recognizing that now, and I think he feels almost ashamed at the way he had been treating Joe. Later on, after the, all the plans are made, Joe and Pip and Biddy and Mrs. Joe are sitting around the fire. Pip asks Joe, Joe, have you told Biddy? No, Pip, returned Joe, still looking at the fire and holding his knees tight, as if he had private information that they intended to make off somewhere. Which, I left it to yourself, Pip. I would rather you told Joe. Pip's a gentleman of fortune, then, said Joe, and God bless him in it. Biddy dropped her work and looked at me. Joe held his knees and looked at me. I looked at both of them. After a pause, they both heartily congratulated me. But there was a certain touch of sadness in their congratulations that I rather resented. Here's what I love about Dickens, is that I can laugh at this one line, you know, that he's holding on to his knees so tightly that it's almost as if he had heard a rumor that his legs were going to go flying off and he wanted to hold them still. But then in the very next short, shortly right after that, he can make you feel emotional and heartbroken because he says that as he's telling what happened, that they look at him almost with sadness and Pip says, I rather resented that. You know, this is happy. And And so he resents that. And now watch how Pip's attitude begins to change uh, throughout this course of the chapter. Uh, He said later, he says, I never could have believed it without experience. But as Joe and Biddy became more at their cheerful ease again, I became quite gloomy. Dissatisfied with my fortune, of course I could not be. But it is possible that I may have been without quite knowing it. 
dissatisfied with myself. So older Pip again is looking back at younger Pip saying, was this money, this thing that I wanted, was this really the best thing that could have happened to me like I thought at the time? And I, I think he's looking back and saying, no, I, w- I was disappointed in myself and the way I am now acting towards those who would be in station beneath me. So as they're discussing this and, and discussing about what life will be like without Pip, it says that they would look at him often and he said, I felt offended as if they were expressing some mistrust of me, though heaven knows they never did by word or sign. So he's already beginning to put on airs and, you know, that he thinks that, oh, they don't trust me now. They don't, they don't like me. They are, why are they acting sad? This is a good thing. And he resents that and he's feeling offended by their actions and all of these things. As they continue to talk and Pip mentions that he's going to come back, they want to see him in his gentleman's clothes and he says that he, he will probably be able to do that. And Biddy said she wanted to see him in his gentleman's clothes. And there's this interesting exchange where, Pip interrupts Biddy and basically says, well, if you hadn't been so quick to interrupt me, I was going about to tell you I was, I would let you see me in those clothes. Um, but, you, you know, you interrupted before I could say it. And so here, here's what he, he says to Biddy about that. He says, if you had waited another moment, Biddy, you would have heard me say that I shall bring my clothes here in a bundle one evening, most likely on the evening before I go away. Biddy said no more. Handsomely forgiving her, I soon exchanged an affectionate goodnight with her and Joe and went up to bed. Wonderful. Um, Biddy can now live the rest of her life knowing that Pip has deemed to forgive her for her uh, interruption. Uh, Phew, you know, I'm sure Biddy was quite pleased to receive that. (laughs) Um, Yeah, I'm being sarcastic, right? It's funny how quickly the money is changing Pip's opinion of himself and Biddy and Joe. It's like I, I said a week or two ago, these these are going to be hard chapters because I love, I really, you, you really caught a hold of, I really enjoyed Pip at the beginning of the novel, but now seeing how money has started to change him and seeing how um, being, um, and seeing how being bullied by Estella is changing him and maybe his, his upbringing, uh, the treatment of his sister all these things are are working in in him to his desire to escape this life has become so great that he's willing to sacrifice his character to get what he wants that's that's my i don't know maybe that's a little a little harsh but that's kind of where my brain is thinking right now um i'll have to I'll have to see more as as this unfolds what what to make of that but that night as he's in bed he sees that uh, Joe and Biddy are outside talking, and he says, for some reason or other, Joe seems like he's been in, he's in one of comfort. He, you know, he just doesn't understand. Why does Joe, why are they sad? This is a good thing. This is what I want. You know, that's Pip's in Pip's mind. He says, I drew away from the window and sat down in my one chair by the bedside, feeling it very sorrowful and strange that this first night of my bright fortunes should be the loneliest I had ever known. And I find that, and that's uh, at the end of the second to the last paragraph, really fascinating thoughts that now that he got what he wanted, why does he feel so lonely? You know, this is the happiest news he's ever been given. Why does he feel so alone? And so that, so with that, we're brought to the end of part 11, um, the, the weekly part 11 that was published on February 9th in 1861. And again, in case I hadn't mentioned it, this was published in Dickens's magazine all the year round, uh, and it's in a, we're in the uh, February 9th, 1861 issue. What's interesting about chapter 19 is that we are now going to see how the money continues to change Pip, but also how it affects people around Pip. So Joe and Biddy have not really changed in their behavior towards Pip, other than saying you know how much they're going to miss him, and looking sad and morose uh, and looking sad and, and Pip doesn't understand why, you know, he wants people to be excited for him. He wants people to, to, uh, as we find out, pay attention to him. He's, he's walking around thinking he goes to the marshes. He says, I strolled out alone 
proposing to finish off the marshes at once and get them done with. So he's saying goodbye to his town, to his home. As I passed the church, I felt, as I had felt during service in the morning, a sublime compassion for the poor creatures who were destined to go there Sunday after Sunday, all their lives through, and to lie obscurely at last among the low green mounds. I promised myself that I would do something for them one of these days and formed a plan and outline for bestowing a dinner of roast beef and plum pudding, a pint of ale, and a gallon of condescension upon everybody in the village. I'm reading this as if he were being a bit condescending and, and almost arrogant that, you know, now that he's going to be a gentleman of the world, he is going to get to make a name for himself. And he feels sorry for those people who have to go to the church week by week and live their lives here in obscurity and be buried and died and forgotten and never known. You know, uh, maybe I'll do something nice for them someday. I'll, I'll, I'll provide them a dinner. Uh, maybe he's earnest in this right now, or I have never been given a large sum of money. Now, I am not opposed to that. If you would love to give me a large sum of money, uh, you will find my contact information below. Uh, I take uh, cash, checks, credit card, you know, whatever. I I'm open to it, okay? Um, uh, but seriously, you know, you think about what will I do if I win the lottery? Well, I, you know, I'm going to give to charity and I'm going to do this and that. And we have all these good intentions, but how often do we really fall through? But here, I, I feel like, Pip is maybe just being a little condescending. Oh, I'll give him a meal. Oh, well, gee, thanks, Pip. I can have a full tummy for one night. <laughs> uh, as he continues to walk and meditate, he's thinking if Miss Havisham attended me for Estella. And while he's thinking about this, he falls asleep. We, we come to find that Joe has followed him and is uh, apparently he just falls. They just fall asleep in the in the ditch there or in the grass. And. Joe follows him and uh, they have a conversation and, you know, Pip tells Joe, it's a pity you didn't learn more when you were here. And it sounds like Pip has intention to do, you know, to do something for Joe, I, I think in the financial meaning. And he says, what I meant was that when I came into my property and was able to do something for Joe, it would have been much more agreeable if he had been better qualified for a rise in station. He was so perfectly innocent of my meaning, however that I thought I would mention it to Biddy in preference. You know, Pip is trying to hint that I'll remember you, but I think what he means is, you know, I'm going to help you. I'm going to give you money when I get into my money. And he said, it's too bad you couldn't have been better paying attention better when you were learning because if I give you money, that means you're going to have to change and, you know, live differently and, and behave differently. And he doesn't think Joe is understanding that. And so... Pip goes to Biddy and says that uh, he asks Biddy, he says that you that you will not omit any opportunity of helping Joe on a little. How helping him on? asked Biddy with a steady sort of glance. Well, Joe is a dear good fellow. In fact, I think he is the dearest fellow that ever lived. But he is rather backward in some things. For instance, Biddy, in his learning and his manners. Although I was looking at Biddy as I spoke, and although she opened her eyes very wide when I had spoken. She did not look at me. Oh, his manners. Won't his manners do then? said Biddy, plucking a black currant leaf. My dear Biddy, they do very well here. Oh, they do very well here, interrupted Biddy, looking closely at the leaf in her hand. Hear me out, but if I were to remove Joe into a high sphere, as I should hope to remove him when I fully come into my property, they would hardly do him justice. And don't you think he knows that? asked Biddy. It was such a very provoking question, for it had never in the most distant manner occurred to me, that I said snappishly, Biddy, what do you mean? Biddy, having rubbed the leaf to pieces between her hands, and the smell of a black currant bush has ever since recalled to me that evening in the little garden by the side of the lane, said, Have you never considered that he may be proud? Proud, I repeated with disdainful emphasis. Oh, there are many kinds of pride, said Biddy, looking full at me and shaking her head. Pride is not all of one kind. Well, what are you stopping for? said I. Not all of one kind, resumed Biddy. He may be too proud to let anyone take him out of a place that he is competent to fill and fills well and with respect. To tell you the truth, I think he is. Though it sounds bold in me to say so, 
for you must know him far better than I do. Now, Biddy, said I, I am very sorry to see this in you. I did not expect to see this in you. You are envious, Biddy, and grudging. You are dissatisfied on account of my rise in fortune, and you can't help showing it. And so they go on discussing this situation. I really like Biddy, okay? Uh, I didn't really remember her too much from my reading readings before, but I like how she's, she's just pretty much not putting up with Pip's nonsense and putting him in his place. Uh, she's showing a, a little sarcasm, which I always enjoy. You know, oh, they do very well here, do they? You know, his, uh, uh, Pip, uh, excuse me, Joe's manners. But I love what she says about this again when she says, he may be too proud to let anyone take him out of a place that he is competent to fill, fills well and with respect. And for, for Joe, that's all he needs. He's in a place that he is competent to fill. He's good at what he does and he does it well. And he does, and he has respect from the people in town, from the people he serves and works for. He is a good man and doesn't need money to make him better. He is content with who he is and where he is. And if only all of us could learn such a lesson. And Biddy sees that in Joe. And I think she wishes, wishes she could see that in Pip because Pip is not content. I'm trying to, you know, balance this with the idea of having passion and drive and wanting to succeed. And I don't think that that's necessarily wrong. But with Pip, he's going about it the wrong way. It, it you know, it's good to have that that drive to do good things, to do great things. And Pip says of all of this that oh, you're just envious. You're dissatisfied. You know, you're jealous. Honestly, Biddy's not. I think she would rather be poor. And I think Joe's the same. He'd rather be poor and respected than wealthy and corrupt or wealthy and proud. So now, oh boy, I just had this thought. Pip is saying it's too bad Joe couldn't have learned lessons from you better because when I give him money, his manners aren't, aren't suitable. When in truth, maybe it's Pip who did not learn better from Biddy. Uh, maybe Joe learned just just fine from Biddy for what he needed, but maybe Pip was the one not listening and not you know head knowledge, but life knowledge, uh, how to be a good person. He maybe wasn't paying attention to um, to Biddy. So uh, after that discussion, Pip goes to order his clothes, and he's finding that when people find out that he's rich. They start treating him differently and they're fawning over him. They're, you know, there's this scene with Mr. Trab, the, uh, the, the guy who makes the clothes. I, what is it? <laughs> um, a tailor. There we go. Um, that he, you know, he starts fawning all over Joe and treating him like royalty. And Pip is just, did I say Joe? I meant Pip. I'm um, treating Pip like royalty. And Pip is just drinking this all in, like, this is the life I wanted. He goes to uh, buy his, his tickets and, and his clothing items. And here's an example of people that change when they find out who he is. Uh, it says, It was not necessary to explain everywhere that I had come into a handsome property. But whenever I said anything to that effect, it followed that the officiating tradesman ceased to have his attention diverted through the window by the high street and concentrated his mind upon me. So then he goes to uh, Mr. Pumblechooks and relays to him what happened and allows Mr. Pumblechook to also fawn all over him and try to uh, kiss up to him and all these things. They, uh, they get drunk. They, they even talk good things about Pip's sister. And Mr. Pumblechook is just, you know, you know he, 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 this reminds me of when you win, when somebody wins the lottery and suddenly everyone is your best friend. Uh, again, I have no idea what that's like, but anybody wishing to give me large piles of money can email me at the link below, okay? <laughs> yeah, I'm sure my, my inbox will be empty today. It's not that I want to be rich. I just want to own every book ever written, so I'm a little behind. But anyway, 
And so we really get to see Mr. Pumblechook again, his character come out. It's just gross, you know, that he, he follows the money uh, along the ways of his saying goodbye. Um, he also goes to Miss Havisham's house to uh, say goodbye to Miss Havisham. She says, tells Pip that he, she already had heard uh, through Jaggers, the lawyer. Jaggers had been there visiting. Pip uh, again is saying, well, this proves my suspicion that Miss Havisham is my secret benefactor. Pip is getting ready to leave. It says, well, she went on, you have a promising career before you. Be good, deserve it, and abide by Mr. Jaggers' instructions. She looked at me and looked at Sarah, and Sarah's countenance wrung out of her watchful face a cruel smile. Goodbye, Pip. You will always keep the name of Pip, you know. Yes, Miss Havisham. Goodbye, Pip. So Pip, again, thinking, well, she knows the details of this agreement. So you know, he's like, finally, she, she gave me her property. And this is what Pip wanted. And so now he's thinking, Estella is meant to be mine. And this property is meant to be mine. And her money is meant to be mine. There's a, such an accurate description of Pip's final night trying to sleep before he's about to leave to fulfill his dream. And I, I, I just love the accuracy of this because have you ever wanted something so desperately and the day was approaching when it would happen and you're just thinking the night before something's going to happen to ruin this whole thing. Something's going to happen to cause it not to happen. And maybe that's my anxiety talking, but I, I tend to do that quite a bit. And I, I really identified with Pip here as he's struggling to sleep but his dreams are just tormenting him of what could happen to cause all of this to, to fall apart. The next morning, as he prepares to go, he uh, says goodbye to his family, takes up his luggage, and, and leaves. Says, the last I saw them was when I presently heard a scuffle behind me, and looking back, saw Joe throwing an old shoe after me, and Biddy throwing another old shoe. I stopped then to wave my hat, and dear old Joe waved his strong right arm above his head, crying huskily, Hoorah! And Biddy put her apron to her face. So I <laughs> I thought that was weird as he was leaving there, throwing their checking shoes out the window at him. But uh, apparently, again, that, that was a something they would do for, uh, according to the footnotes in my book, it says that this is done for luck, especially at weddings. And as he gets farther and farther away from town and knowing that the farther he goes, you know, the closer he gets to London and to his new life, the farther he's leaving the old life behind. And it gets to the point where he, he breaks, he cries. I, I love this, that, I mean, that he sobs. I love what Dickens says about tears right near the end. He says, uh, well, he says, heaven knows we need never be ashamed of our tears, for they are rain upon the blinding dust of earth overlying our hard hearts. And I, I love that in Dickens' mind, tears are good because the, our tears cleanse us, cleanses and softens the hard dirt that lays over our hearts or the, the, the blinding dust that lays over our hard hearts. It softens it. So farther and farther he gets away from Joe and he, in the um this end of part of the first stage of Pip's expectations, it says that we we changed again and yet again, and it was now too late and too far to go back. And I went on, and the mists had all solemnly risen now, and the world lay spread before me. I like I like that picture that um, Pip is now coming out of the gloom and the fog of the marshes, and he has a bright future before him. And, you know, it's still not too late for Pip to make sure he stays his good self. Uh, it, it's not that, again, this money was is wrong or that he got it in an ill-gained way. I mean, it was given to him. He had no control over that. But what he does have control over is his character, as, as is the same for all of us. But he's feeling quite optimistic now at, as the end of the first stage comes to its conclusion. Um, this concludes part 12, published on February 16th in 1861. So we did it. We made it through a third of the book. And just a couple of thoughts here as we think about what's going to happen next. Uh, just from, the, from part one overall, from the first stage overall, 
we begin with Pip in a graveyard, and now we see him heading into the light with the world spread out before him. So he, it's almost like he's going from death to life, and uh, that's that's interesting imagery. Uh, he had been c- controlled and, and consumed with guilt and fear and poverty, but now he is excited and proud and has a sense of entitlement, but he's eager to meet uh, the future. Some questions that we have here is, is who is Pip's benefactor? Um, Miss ha- uh, Pip thinks it's Miss Havisham. Uh, so we will, uh, and, and there's no reason to doubt that. Uh, or, or is there? <laughs> dun, dun, dun. How will Pip be changed by this great expectation he's been given? Um, how has he changed already? Well, we already see how some of it he's changing. He's beginning to think much highly, very highly of himself. He's beginning to think down on people like Joe and Biddy and treating them very, very poorly which I think he's already regretting uh, there at the end of this chapter 19. And I love this idea that Dickens is espousing, that the idea of, of humility, uh, of being humble, of not so much poverty, but being in a low station in society is not a bad thing if you meet that with dignity and respect. And, and see, I don't know a lot about the whole class struggle there. Uh, and maybe what he's saying is there's bad parts of that that I'm not seeing. So, you know, I, I'm open to discuss that. But I, I like that idea that whatever you do, it's not the job that makes you a, a important person or a good person. It's your character. It's your attitude. Joe, you know, had a lowly job, but he was a good man. And for me and, and, and you know, for him. That's sufficient. That was good. And that was satisfying. And, and so Joe was proud of what he did, proud in a good way, and had no wish to be pulled from that. He was and held a respectful position. And uh, so whatever it is that you do, I, I, is my hope that you do it with, with joy and with satisfaction and, and with pride. And if you can't, find something you can do. Uh, you can do that and do it well, uh, because therein lies the real joy uh, of living. So that brings us to the end of stage one. Next week, we're going to read chapters, I believe, chapters 20, 21, and 22. Uh, I, I think it's just three chapters. So we will we'll go ahead and uh, read those next week. And again, looking look out on Saturdays for, for the videos rather than uh, Fridays. Give us one extra day, I guess. Not really, but (laughs) um, that's going to work a little better in my schedule. Thank you so much for joining. Um, Below, you'll find links for um, the Voxer channel, where we're probably the most active right now. You can go ahead and request to be added to the Discord channel as well. I'll probably have things there uh, eventually. Also, uh, you can comment down below what you think of these chapters. What do you think about some of these thoughts and views that I, I brought up from this that I'm thinking about in this chapter. Tell me, you know, what you all think of, of section one. How does it work as a story or as a weekly story? Are you, are you capturing the excitement of those weekly, those weekly cliffhangers? I mean, I'm loving it. I love it. And I am getting so much more out of this reading than I ever have before. Uh, in part, thanks to, to you folks who are reading along and adding your comments and thoughts. So let's keep that discussion going. And again, if you are behind, that's perfectly okay. Just uh, you know, leave comments when, where you can and how you can. And I, I'll love to continue this discussion even on, on past chapters. So thank you so much for listening. Uh, if you're on the podcast side, thank you for listening. Uh, thank you for watching. Thanks again. And until next time, happy reading.